Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast, episode number 30. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I've started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talent. The podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests are thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way. Come to this show to debate, discuss, and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. One size doesn't fit all. What Airbnb or Google do around the employee experience may not be applicable in a smaller company. This is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Rod Wagner, calling from Minneapolis. Rod is one of the most foremost authorities on collaboration and happiness at work. He is the VP of Strategy at BI Worldwide and the author of this great book, Widgets, the 12 New Rules for Managing Your Employee as They Were Real People. Today with Rod, we will talk about why companies should not consider the employees as assets, what is the principle of reciprocity, and how it impacts the employer-employee relationship, what are the 12 rules of engagement he develops in his book, and how he foresees the future of employee happiness. This week's EX podcast is sponsored by Structural. Structural unleashes the potential of people and teams by giving organizations real-time mobile access to employee data. Find, engage, and retain talent with the Structural Employee Success Platform. EX Podcast listeners can visit structural.com slash EX Podcast to get access to the latest employee experience resources, including the Employee Success Playbook, featuring 10 research-backed methods to improve business outcomes. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rod. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes. You can open up the iTunes app and type in Stefan Vincent or EX Podcast and you will find us there. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. Thanks for your support and loyalty. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX Podcast. Today's guest is Rod Wagner calling from Minneapolis. Rod is one of the most foremost authorities on collaboration and happiness at work. He's the VP of strategy at BI Worldwide and the author of this great book, Widgets, the 12 new rules for managing your employee as if they were real people. So Rod, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Great to be with you. So you've got, first of all, you've got a very interesting background as you had a career far from the employee engagement space early on. Tell us a bit more about who Rod Wagner is. I began my career as a journalist uh, covering police incidents, court cases, uh, fire departments, all that uh, public safety stuff. Uh, So I began as someone who was studying the human condition in many cases from the most depressing days that people have. Um, I became somewhat frustrated that my newspaper was not a great place to work, and I thought there had to be a better way to run a newspaper, but I also knew I didn't have the credentials to run it, and so I decided to go back to school, got an MBA, 
migrated to the business side of media, and now I have the opportunity to study the human condition on the other side, particularly to focus on what happens in the workplace when someone is led and managed uh, by fantastic leaders and managers and when they are happy at work. So now that you are at BI Worldwide, what is your role there and which companies do you work with and what challenges do you see that do you had them solve at a high level? Yeah. Sure. I'm the vice president of strategy, so my job is to bring the best science to bear on client decisions about the employee experience that they hope to create, the employee experience that creates the highest levels of performance. That What that means at a particular client varies dramatically based on whether they're in a good spot or a bad spot, whether what we're increasingly calling their employee value proposition is aligned or misaligned. It's part of what I really enjoy about my job because there's such incredible variety. I reached a point about a decade or so ago when in reading the Wall Street Journal or Business Week or Forbes uh, that I was starting to have know the story behind the story whenever I saw a particular company in the news to say, well, I know what's really going on or I know something that's not in that particular uh, article. I enjoy that tremendously. Uh, with whom do we work? Actually, we have a pretty tight confidentiality clause in all our agreements, so I'm not able to, to name names, um, but I have had the uh, privilege of going from every place to uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer, medical device people, military, um, you name it. I've had a chance to see a little bit of everything, and, and I, I feel very privileged that I have one of the greatest jobs on the planet. It is quite an interesting and fascinating job, that's for sure. And you alluded to uh, employee engagements and uh, performance as well. So one of the big challenges I think organizations are facing when it comes to whether or not they decide to invest in employee experience and employee engagement initiatives is you know, how it's going to impact my employees' performance and ultimately how it's going to impact my bottom line. Uh, do you see that... Um, those obstacles and pushbacks as well when you talk to or when you interact with some of your customers? Uh, it certainly is. I think we're in a strange time relative to some decades ago. Uh, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, the prevailing ethos was that you look out for your employees because they are your employees. There was a moral obligation that if someone is going to spend their whole career here, and it was more common back then that someone would spend their entire career with one organization, then we as leaders have an obligation to make sure that their experience is good. It was more personal. Uh, there was a greater degree of loyalty in both directions. Increasingly, I think, in, and I'll speak broadly here, increasingly, Uh, the relationship is more transactional, less loyal, coming from the companies. I think people are still eager to be loyal, but they're not sure if their loyalty will be uh, misplaced. Uh, it's more common that organizations are going to look at quarterly results rather than annual results, rather than uh, results over many years. And it's more common that an organization will say, well, we're going to make some layoffs so that we can make our quarterly um, half year or annual numbers. And so now people are saying, well, what's the return on investment? If I'm going to recognize my employees, if we're going to have an all company meeting, uh, even in some cases, if we're going to communicate this information to our employees, can you tell me what the return on investment is of doing A or B or C? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult analytical process, even though you know it's the right thing to do to try to, to try to predict an ROI on every single act is analytically almost impossible. And yet, if you look overall, the return on investment of creating a powerful employee experience is incredibly positive. And so, I, to some degree, I don't, 
I, I will ask the leaders that I'm working with what, what their motivations are. And sometimes I'll hear from leaders who say, we simply owe this to our employees. More commonly, they'll say, we're doing this because it will increase the performance of the business. I can give them the compelling numbers that show that it is a strong, positive return on investment if that's their the way that they are calibrating this. And in many cases, whether they're doing it out of a sense of moral obligation or for the return on investment, they will be doing the same thing. So the employee will still get the experience that one would hope they would have in either case. The, the third category, the one that I worry about the most, is someone who is overly parsimonious about doing things that do have a strong return on investment. And so in some ways, they're not even being greedy well. They are they're miscalculating just how powerful that reciprocal instinct is of employees, and therefore they don't do for the employees the things that they ought to, even if they were just focusing on what's best for the business. Yeah, th- that's a good point. And on, on this on this line, I really love this quote in your book: "Your people are not your are not your greatest assets. They're not yours, and they're not assets." So, what do you mean by this? I think it's a tremendous quote, but I'd like to get your angle on this. Well, I think in many cases, I would first say that I believe those who say it mean it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I believe what they're really trying to say is the most important part of our business are the people who work here, and they are the ones who are going to give us a sustainable competitive advantage. And so in that way, I don't disagree with it at all. But I think the words that we choose have consequences. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm literal as a former reporter and editor i'm literal about the the particular word that we use and because in some cases it can lead to consequences that we don't intend if we don't choose the right term an asset is passive an asset is owned and it's owned strictly for the benefit of the organization if you think about a cattle farmer uh, he or she owns the the dairy cows that are part of the business. And those cattle are bought and sold and live their lives to supply the milk for the dairy farmer to make him or her money down the line. Uh, If you're talking about lumber or buildings or computers or things, these are all assets that are owned by the company. They are acquired uh, and and gotten rid of strictly based on the interests of the business. Uh, People are not assets. We settled in the United States. We settled that question in uh, 1865 that, no, you may not own people. Uh, So, I mean, in in that way, I want to kind of put a little bit of an edge on it. No, they can't, they cannot technically be assets uh, in any kind of an accounting class. You can't count them in that way. Uh, And more importantly, they're, they're people. We have a moral obligation to them. They are in at the organization to fulfill part of their lives, to to support themselves, to take care of their families. Uh, I would argue that looking out for people is a an important outcome of the organization equal to and parallel to its responsibility to shareholders or to other constituencies that are part of the reason that the business exists. You talk about the principle of reciprocity, which is the foundation of your book. Can you elaborate on this? And, and then we'll talk about your uh, 12 rules of engagement a bit, uh, a bit later. But I'd like to hear about what, how you define reciprocity and what does it mean for organizations and employees? There was a sea change in the field of economics over the last quarter century the traditional view of people in the economics textbooks was um, called the economic man or the the economic woman. And this mythical creature uh, made decisions that were most rational, most logical. As behavioral economics has come to the fore, um, maybe most notably in the Nobel Prizes awarded to Daniel Kahneman some years ago, and then most recently this year to Richard Thaler, uh, one of the things that we have learned from behavioral economics is that people are reciprocal. Uh, 
we, to some degree, keep score on whether people are friend or foe, whether a, an organization is looking out for us or neglecting us. And to some degree, uh, in, a, in, a, in a far less calculated way than the traditional view would say, we reciprocate what we receive. Uh, and so if an organization looks out for its people, those employees have essentially a moral obligation that is formed within them. They have this reflex that they they want to speak well of the organization. They feel like they should work hard for the company and for their coworkers, their managers, their leaders. Uh, they uh, they want to stay longer. They feel um, they they want to do whatever they can to make sure the organization succeeds because that organization is looking out for them. On the other side, if an organizational is an organization is neglectful of its employees. They feel less of an obligation. They still feel a certain obligation. I'm, a, I'm actually surprised at just how how professional uh, and how mature people are, even in the face of an organization that's not looking out for them. They'll they kind of had have. have uh, my dad's ethos of uh, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Yeah, they don't treat me so well, but if they're still my company. I should still look out for them right up until they resign. But it's an important. It is the umbrella concept. If one is to whether you call it the employee value proposition, the employee experience, morale, happiness, or an employee engagement. If you're if you're looking into any of those, the overriding concept is reciprocity. That employees are looking out for the company in large part uh, to the degree that the company is looking out for them. Right. It goes beyond just a paycheck. It's really about it. It goes beyond the paycheck or safety in the workplace uh, or even benefits. It's really about personal and professional growth. It's about uh, being able to acquire new skills. It's about collaboration, innovation, creativity. Uh, it's not a good transaction as it may have been in the past. We spend so much, those people who are working full-time spend so many of their week, waking hours at work that to a large degree, the places where we choose to work are the conditions under which we choose to live. Mm-hmm. We're making a lifestyle choice by joining a particular organization. This idea that um, that work and life are separate never was entirely true, but particularly in an age of constant connection with the office and sometimes working from home and sometimes doing personal business um, uh, at, the, at the office, make it so that our, our jobs, our professions, and our choice of employer are heavily intertwined with our lives. And therefore, it, it, you're right. Yes, it's much more than a paycheck uh, because we have really chosen in large part where we will live by choosing where we're going to work. So let's spend some time over those 12 rules of engagement. Obviously, we won't go into too much details, and I would commend our listeners to read your book. But let's go at a high level through um, some of those and so that our listeners can understand what you mean in your, in your book. So the first one is get inside their heads. Yet each of these is a rule that we recommend to leaders and managers in answer to the question, well, what do I need to do to best motivate my people? And this is part of a, a research initiative that began six years ago when I joined BI Worldwide, taking everything that I knew and others at the organization knew about what's traditionally been called employee engagement and it, uh, ad- adapting it to how conditions had changed and in many cases, dialing things up a little bit. So each of these is an aspect that resulted from research. This isn't just my opinion. This isn't back of napkin uh, kind of stuff. This is uh, these, these are factors that emerged 
from a whole host of hundreds of questions that we asked to people and then looked at what which ones were most powerful for motivating people to stay, to focus on customers, to innovate, collaborate, all those things that an organization needs. The one, one of them I forced to the front, and it's this one, get inside their heads. The reason I forced it to be rule number one is because – in, whether you call it employee engagement, happiness, satisfaction, morale, what have you, it is an individual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. There's a risk in this particular discipline that in looking at aggregated numbers, we will make it kind of one size fits all. We'll say, well, the organization is at this level of happiness and the organization feels this way about their sense of progress or about their recognition or about the transparency of the organization, when in fact that's simply describing the average, and each of those averages has a whole range of feelings around that that cover all the way from high to low. So if one is going to uh, take on this issue and this opportunity, one has to begin by understanding that uh, you you need to make this come alive for each person in the unique conditions, the unique circumstances and background that each of them brings to the table. In other words, treat each employee as a unique person. That's the foundation, the, the gateway, if you will, to all the other rules. Yeah, it's being people-centric. The rule number one is, the rule number two is make them fearless. What does it mean? To some degree, this is uh, emerged from the capital G, capital R, Great Recession of 2008-2009 uh, to a degree that I'm not sure we yet fully appreciate. Fear was put in the mix that you just might lose your job. Now, that was true before, but I think the recession – took the snow globe and gave it a really good shake. I think it's part of the reason why pay still hasn't gone up, because companies are still afraid to, that they're going to raise pay too too much and, and be caught flat-footed when there's a downturn in revenue. And it means that there's this background, even in relatively good conditions right now, that people are worried that they might lose their job. And fear is toxic. Uh, it's taken down certain organizations. It took down Circuit City. Um, they created a culture of fear by firing their highest paid uh, and their commission base. So they're also the highest performing employees. And it was pretty much the, the nail in the coffin that finished them off and let, and let Best Buy win that, um, that war between those two large consumer electronics retailers. Rule number three is make money a non-issue. We wrote these very deliberately to be consistent with what we were seeing in the research, both, both the broad research and what we were finding in our, in our own research. Uh, money is, for most people, a background issue. It becomes an issue when you join an organization and you're negotiating your pay. It becomes an issue during your annual appraisal if that's when your pay is adjusted. But most of us do not run home and say, particularly with direct deposit these days, hey, guess what? I got paid this Wednesday the same amount that I got paid two Wednesdays ago. I saw the direct deposit statement. I'm, they're still paying me. It's just not something we talk about all that much unless it becomes an issue. It becomes an issue if a recruiter calls you up and says uh, he or she is offering you another $20,000. It becomes an issue if you find out that the guy down the hallway who joined after you and whose performance you think is lower than yours is making substantially more than you. So in most cases, the, the imperative for organizations is to pay well enough to pay fairly, to pay generously if they can, so that it stays back where it's supposed to be as a non-issue. And that's a tricky one because the, you know, how much transparency you can have, or can you have around the salaries and the compensation? I can remember the name of the company, but there's a company where everybody gets paid $70,000, or whatever your level is, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, and that the CEO actually who implemented it sees that he sees a much higher performance from the from the employees. So I guess transparency is a it's it's a it's a sort of a taboo in organizations, right? Even though I'm not even sure if employees actually would welcome transparency on compensation as well. 
Uh, they wouldn't necessarily in some cases because right. of the legacy, because of the culture. It's a very strange aspect. Some organizations say that their employees may not even discuss their pay. Now, there are legal limitations to how much you can tell an employee, don't talk about your pay. People are posting these kinds of things on Glassdoor. So that's yeah. that's a losing battle. On the other hand, there are countries where pay is transparent, where everybody's tax return can be looked at. And there are certainly models of pay transparency that work quite well. The United States military, if you know someone's pay grade and you know their, whether they are in a submarine or not in a submarine, in a combat position, not in a combat position, how they're posted, you can get within several thousand dollars, if not several hundred dollars of what their pay is. And it works just fine because those are the rules going in. We talked about uh, about how much time or how many hours people spend at work versus you know outside of work. So one important um, aspect of the happiness at work is people to be able to to thrive and to grow. And that's your rule number four: help them drive, uh, thrive. Sorry, help them thrive. Thriving is a collaborative matter between the employee and the company. The company can best serve this by making clear that if your kid has a soccer game at five o'clock, we want you to leave at 4.30 or 4.15. That's as important a commitment as anything you do within this organization. I think the most enlightened organizations also are very keen to ensure their employees do not work excessively long hours because it's a losing battle. You actually don't get more from those extra hours. Mistakes can be created. Accidents can happen. The optimal way to manage a human being is to ensure that he or she is uh, on the job, amped up, uh, working at a, at a high velocity for a certain number of hours during the week, roughly 40, and then the rest of the time is not thinking about work. The, the science is suggesting that when our brains are not at work, they are actually coalescing and making sense of all the things we're doing at work, and the brain is preparing itself to be really good at the, ne the next day at work. But part of this is also the responsibility of the employee. I've begun doing sessions for employees themselves to take control of the portion of happiness that is under their control, and this one jumps right to the front. There's a lot of science coming in that says you need to give yourself, as one of the scientists in this area calls it, a non-negotiable eight-hour opportunity for sleep. It will make you happier. It will make you more efficient. It will make you more productive. And that is not something a company can do uh, beyond making sure they're not trying to work someone 60 or 50 or 60 hours a week. That Rather, that's something that the employee has to take responsibility for. It's still very much present in mentalities as well that you know, the, the longer you stay at work, the more maybe indispensable or the more productive you are, which is not necessarily true, but it's the perception and the impression of it. That's changing. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's changing in some organizations who are saying staying late means you didn't sleep very well last night or we gave you too much to do or – um, or you need to organize things better, get yeah. in here, get your work done, and get out. Um, and the, the science is saying that, that's, it, that it is counterproductive. We still, there is still some baggage, the kind of American Protestant work ethic, mm -hmm. that you are most admirable if you are sleep-deprived, if you are working <laughs> 60 hours, if you sacrifice everything for the company. It's really... The, 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 I, there's no better word for it. it it's really stupidity, both on the organization's uh, point and f from the point of the employee. It's just not a bright thing to do. It's a good point. It's probably a, a cultural thing as well. I don't think that it happens as much in uh, Latin countries as much as it happens in Anglo-Saxon countries. I agree. Yeah, there are very large cultural differences. Uh, rule number five is be cool. 
What does it this mean? This one, you know, my dad passed away years ago. I, 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 uh, there are a number of reasons why I wish he were still here. One of them is to, I'd love to show him this because in his generation, this way, he would have said, this is such a stupid rule. This is, <laughs> are you, what do you, you know, work is work. It's not supposed, what do you mean cool? Um, it, it's not about enjoying yourself at work. But along the lines of my earlier point, we spend so many hours on the job that, why should it not be enjoyable and the, and be an experience that you'd be able to brag about and say, we did something fantastic today. We invented something new. We tried something new. We have got the coolest product that we're getting ready to bring to market. And more important, much like all of these rules, they emerge from the research. And it turns out that when we ask people questions such as, this is a cool place to work. It's very strongly connected with people's intentions to stay, work hard, collaborate, and, and innovate. So the question is not, is it important to be a cool place to work? It simply is. The question is, how do we make this particular organization cool. uniquely cool that will be compelling to the kinds of people we want to attract here? And what what is it? What are some of the components? Is it is it the office space design? Is it the how you know the dress code? Is it how would you define coolness? It is all those things. It is the office space. It's the dress code. It is the um, having the opportunity to collaborate with smart people who will teach you something along the way. It is uh, oddly enough transparent leadership that I'll say, here's where we're going, that create a vision for where the organization is going. The overall uh, theme to coolness is that the organization is confident in what it is, not trying to be another organization, but here's who we are. This is what we're going to. So uh, cool at NASA would be very different than cool at, let's say, LLB. Yes. But NASA and L.L. Bean both know what they stand for. They're longstanding organizations that do a certain thing well and have done it for a long time. And they're not making apologies to people that uh, uh, L.L. Bean does not make apologies that they're that they're not Cabela's, for example. And NASA does not make apologies that they're not Google. They're, they are doing their own cool thing in their own cool way, unapologetically. Right. The, we, we talked about transparency, which is rule number six, be bold, boldly transparent. This is one where the bulk of the obligation is on the company and particularly on the senior leadership. Uh, some there's just a huge range in how much information that companies share with their people. Right. I think a lot of this comes down to the CEO frequently getting in front of people, and when not able to discuss a future transaction or big decision that's looming over the organization, will nonetheless say, um, you know, barred from this by the Securities and Exchange commission from being able to tell you what the decision is or, or or we don't even know what the decision is but i can tell you how we will make the decision i'll tell you the principles upon which we'll make it and how we will communicate with you along the way this helps to to dampen fear you know, in many cases we are most fearful about the things that uh, that w w where where there's an unknown where we think we're going to be surprised by something that's very powerful if a CEO and his or her uh, senior leaders, fellow senior leaders, are getting up in front of people and saying, hey, we just found out some information. We wanted to get it out to you quickly. Here's what we're doing about it, um, and here's how you can help. It just helps people sleep better at night. Is there an impact on transparency and the size of an organization? I think there yeah, – uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, certainly. Because – it is harder to feel a direct connection to a senior leader if he or she is uh, two time zones away and you never get a chance to interact with this particular individual. That having been said, there are 
leaders of small organizations who never leave their organizations or or, or, or their their or their offices, they, and they aren't seen much by people who are not their quote unquote direct reports. So yes, it's it's a tougher thing to accomplish if you are in a large organization to get this um, done, but that's not the overriding factor. Rule number seven is don't kill the meaning. This rule originally, in the first iteration, we called it give it meaning. And then as we did additional research uh, and thought about it more, we realized that that was kind of presumptuous to tell someone what kind of meaning they should get from the work. I think it's fine to connect the dots and show people how what they do has an impact down the, down the line. In fact, it's very powerful. Um, but the broader research and our own research shows that people create meaning, even in it is, this is certainly true in a life changing, life saving profession, such as medicine, such as uh, the justice system or emergency services. You clearly understand you have like you literally saved someone's life. So it's hard not to see that there's meaning there. But the same thing is also true in situations where you're making shoes or you're creating a new ice cream recipe or something like that, that people will talk about it in terms very similar to a life-changing or life-saving profession. They take that sense of meaning from it, that they're making people happy with the latest flavor of, of ice cream. So people naturally have a sense of meaning about their job. It can be killed if they see that the company no longer is as dedicated to something that they saw as an important reason why they joined the organization, mm -hmm. or if they see money being diverted. Um, I mentioned in widgets this, uh, the profession of zookeepers. If zookeepers feel like money that ought to be going to the animals is being diverted someplace else, it will kill the sense of meaning and frustrate them. And they will often resign and say, I still believe in it. It's still very important to me, but they're burning me out because I just can't fight the fight anymore. It kills their sense of meaning and it's, it's toxic to their intention to stay at the organization. And that's a tough one because there's, you know, when you interview for a company, you may be sold on some principles and ideas and ideologies um, that may actually not happen in real life. It was sort of a, not a fake picture of the company was, but maybe just the, uh, the, the hiring manager's perception of what the company is or means for him or her, where it could be different for you. So... How how could employees somehow tackle this issue where there was a sort of misconception of what what the meaning was at the beginning during the review process and what actually is once the person gets uh, onboarded? Uh, if it's if it's not there, it's simply not there, and that employee is at great risk of migrating someplace else where they can get this sense of meaning because it is so motivating. Uh, in places where it's less drastic, where it's there, but it's not there in the department that a particular employee joins, um, or it's different, then in many cases, we will adapt. We will say, well, it's not what I thought it was going to be, but there actually is a pretty cool thing they're doing over here. And I kind of like that, particularly if they're well-managed, well-led, well-recognized along the way. It is amazing to me how people will um, migrate. I was at the call center of a large financial institution and talking to someone who said, I'm going to go, uh, I've always wanted to go to nursing school, so I'm going to resign and go to nursing school. And I said, well, you told me about some of the frustrations working here. If you had been better led and managed, do you think you might have done an entire career in banking? And she said to me, yeah, I think I might. I thought that was really interesting that someone's entire career trajectory could be altered based on how well they are led or managed down to a whole career in banking versus switching over to medicine. So we need this. We need a sense of meaning. To some degree, we are I – don't, I don't want to say we're completely agnostic as to what that profession might be. But if we find a supportive, powerful, intense culture in a particular industry, sometimes 
we rewrite our plan. And even in retrospect, we kind of say, yeah, well, this is kind of where I meant to go when, in fact, it wasn't where you meant to go. You just gravitated towards a great organization that gave something meaning where you didn't anticipate you'd necessarily find it. It's an interesting point because let's say that your meaning over time changes or you're no longer feeling um, challenged in your work, right? You may want to move into a different a different business unit, different departments or different role, but if the organization is not transparent about even lateral moves, it doesn't have to be a promotion, um, then such, such, that sense of don't kill the meaning can be lost. So it's, 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 it's a connection of all those different aspects or different roles that we've talked to uh, until now about that way for people to define their meaning, but also somehow find other opportunities to find a new meaning over time. Clearly, people will certainly in the in the environment right now where companies feel more comfortable laying off people. Yeah. People will they will they will migrate. Right, they will uh, migrate. They they'll the the new contract is from a company standpoint. Well, we can we can lay people off as it as the needs of the business change, and so employees are increasingly saying, "I can move to a different job." for a more fulfilling experience, for a more uh, meaningful experience. And that is not being disloyal to my company because those aren't the rules anymore. You go back several decades, that would have been seen as being disloyal to an organization that had brought you along. But now if people find greater meaning or the rest of these 12 rules someplace else uh, and they have the kinds of credentials to make that migration, they're going to go. So something that is still tied to the meaning is... Now, what's my future within the organization? And that's the rule number number eight is see their their future. Humans are, so far as we know, the only species that is able to do this kind of time travel. Uh, we spend an inordinate amount of our time either thinking about the past, reminiscing, or thinking, daydreaming, if you will, about the future. And the science suggests that one of the reasons why our brains spend so much time thinking about the past is we are trying to incorporate the lessons of what went before so that we can play the game, if you will, make the right chess moves for our future. An organization needs to, as part of this unwritten social contract, needs to either present some wonderful prospects for a person down the line within that organization or increasingly be preparing them for a bright future someplace else. And I think the the second one is harder for organizations to be deliberate about, um, but it is equally powerful. And and particularly given companies are sometimes, they're they're no longer making the implicit uh, contract that you're going to work here 20 years. Uh, and therefore, I think they need to adapt themselves to say, well, you might be here four years, you might be here eight or 10 or, or whatever, either based on changes we make or, or decisions you make. But let's make sure that the four years you're here are a springboard for the next four years after that. And to the degree that a company can do that, it gets greater effort from people while they are there and also gets a better review on Glassdoor or other uh, online sites uh, when someone leaves. Yes, and actually I've had on this podcast a few companies that even have a graduation party when someone leaves the company just to celebrate not only the accomplishments uh, and the growth of the employee leaving, but also to wish him or her good luck. And I really believe that an alumni network is a great competitive advantage as well because those people, if they leave on good terms and they had a positive experience, are going to, um, are going to refer people to that same organization. This is one of the areas where borrowing from what's traditionally been called the customer value proposition yes. is hugely helpful for an organization to say, you look at employee uh, at customers for how they view you as soon as they hear about you, what their experience is, and then when they leave uh, or, or you know, have, are in between shopping trips, what they say to other people. I think we need to adapt that to create a stronger employee value proposition or employee experience to look at through the entire quote-unquote lifespan 
of the employee. How did they learn about us? What brought them here? What did they hear about us before they applied? What was it like on their uh, their first day while they were here? How did it go during their first year? Did they did they have a powerful future that we were preparing for them for? And whether the needs of the business changed or the individual went someplace else, how did we part? Um, that's probably an area where organizations could do the most for their their quote unquote brand, which is to ensure that when when the parting, whether it's kind of a rough parting or whether it's uh, perfectly amicable, that that everybody is ultimately okay with it. Yes, uh, and that you have an alumni organization, if you will. Uh, some organizations do this better than others. I uh, mentioned the Navy. You know, the Navy does a great. People who used to be in the Navy speak very highly of the Navy. I think it's also true of newspapers. Actually, people who used to work at a newspaper will speak very highly of their time at a particular newspaper. But most companies, they just kind of say, "Well, uh, bye. I guess game over. Right. You're going to leave." And well, yes, they're leaving. But the communication about your company does not end. They are an alumnus, and there is going to be discussion of your company down the line. I completely agree with you. Uh, rule number nine is magnify their success. We Part of the what's sometimes called total rewards that someone gets from an organization is not just their pay. We're social creatures. We look to each other. To say, did I do the right thing? Was that good? Did you like that? Did I did I knock it out of the park? We part of the, the World Series is going on right now. Part of the reason why a baseball player enjoys hitting a home run in the World Series is not just that you've scored another point, but to hear the roar of the crowd. And the science on this says that we get this rush of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And mm -hmm. the more dopamine we get from something, the more likely we are to repeat it. It's the reason why I say what a company wants to see repeated, it needs to recognize. Yes. Number 10 is unite them. Because we're social creatures, we can accomplish more as a team as a in team. many cases than we can uh, as individuals. And there are, there's a whole, uh, my second book was on collaboration. There are actually principles that bring people together. Uh, principles that have violated actually separate them. But uh, everything from incentives, bonus plans, uh, how a manager or leader sets up a particular group for success, the culture, the expectations uh, among them. When, when Ford was saved, Uh, years ago, part of that process was a, a, an agreement uh, among their senior executives that they wouldn't be saying snotty things about each other outside of meetings or in little whispers to the side. All those kinds of things make the odds of strong collaboration higher, and P, uh, a leader or manager needs to understand what those principles are if they expect true teamwork. Number 11 is let them lead. In the research on motivation, there is a concept called employee voice. Essentially, it means you have a sense of control, that your opinions help frame how the work is done, that you have, that you have influence over your environment and your working conditions. We decided in our first waves of research to see if that wasn't even more powerful than is commonly recognized. We wondered if people didn't just have voice, but they actually had an opportunity to take the lead, to run a project by themselves, with some coaching, of course, to steer the boat. Would that not be more powerful than saying, oh, my opinions seem to count or something that's kind of um, lightweight like that? It turns out, yes, it is. It is more powerful. So if, if you ask someone, do you get the chance to occasionally take the lead, even if you're not in a supervisory position? If their answer is yes, they're more attached to the organization. They work harder for the organization. Yeah, become a leader, be a leader. It doesn't mean to be in a management position, right? It's the ability to influence uh, and bring ideas forward in the organization. Yes, yes, both having, having your ideas valued, but also, uh, hey, guess what? Uh, tonight... Uh, Stefan is going to be running 
is going to be running the show. He's 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 putting out the website tonight or or whatever. Uh, even if you're not in a supervisory position to say, yeah, it, it's yours to run. It's that that will create a certain amount of trepidation the first time someone does it, but they grow in the process. It's exactly. the coolest thing. Like I didn't know that I could do it. My manager helped me a little bit, and uh, hey, it worked. It, it's just hugely uh, motivating for people. So the last rule, number 12, is take it to extremes. This you can think of if you were to take it down to one word is accomplishment. Is there something that you are doing? Well, one of the questions that we ask on the, on the survey that people can experience for themselves is they go to workhappier.com. You can be asked all the questions around <laughs> this and see how you, you, you can score your job. One of the most powerful statements in there when we look at its connection to working hard for the organization and staying at the organization is I believe I can accomplish more at this organization than I can someplace else. Now, part of that you can see is just a logical thing. Well, why would you not be at the organization where you can accomplish more? But part of it is also just the invigoration of, hey, I had never done this before and I got a chance to do a fill in the blank, whatever would be meaningful to you. You know, I ran this particular project. I got in a peer reviewed Uh, paper. Let's say someone is a, a beginning surgeon. I did my first something, something, something surgery uh, that you can claim that and say, have you done that before? Yes, I have. I've done five dozen of those and here's how it's worked and be able to say that. Whereas in another organization, um, you may not have been able to do that. It's very important to that unwritten social contract with employees. So we, we've been through all those 12 rules of engagements and The employee happiness. How do you foresee the future of engagement in the next maybe 5, 10, 15 years? I, I really think there's somewhat of a polarization. I see organizations that are treating their people like widgets, like assets, where the company is being run more by the money managers with a strictly money manager view of the world, seeing people as assets. And uh, that in the short term, that can actually work. In the long term, it doesn't work very well. Then there are other organizations that really are looking out for their people, a group of um, uh, companies where the leadership really does care about the happiness of the employees. I think that's going to continue. Uh, long term, the odds are that the companies that are looking out for their people are going to succeed. They'll be able to hire more people. There'll be a natural churn as the as those who have the, the best credentials leave the organizations where they're treated like widgets and migrate to the organizations where they're treated like real people. So l let me ask you this question. So we talked a, a lot about you know, focusing more on the human aspect of the employee-employer relationship. Um, at the same time, technology has evolved, and now data and employee data and people analytics in organizations uh, are becoming more and more important or at least valuable. Um, so Do you see that the technology advances around machine learning and artificial intelligence, chatbots, etc., or even just data and analytics, would somehow eliminate that human aspect or will actually, on the opposite side, enhance that human experience? I think there's a shaking out that will occur. Uh, the technological tools are so cool and so useful for getting little bits of information here or there when it is most convenient to the employee. Our attention spans are, are shortening, and we it's an on-demand kind of world. So I'm not sure that in that way people can necessarily keep up and deliver in the same, in the same way that technological tools can get that information out there. That having been said, if a client comes to me and says, we really want to inspire people, we want them to think about things differently, we want them to um, give some in-depth thought about their own happiness and their own plan for how they can be most effective at this organization, I'll always recommend an in-person session because that's what gets our brains fully engaged, if you will, in the 
in the issue and and making decisions about where we need to go as uh, as as individuals. All right. Well, now we're getting towards the end of uh, this uh, conversation. So let me ask you a few fun questions. So as we said at the beginning of this uh, episode, you studied as a reporter uh, before moving to your current role. So let me ask you this. As a kid, what was your dream job? Was it to be a reporter? My dream job changed a number. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And then my mom said, <laughs> well, <too>. since <laughs> why not, right? Top Gun. Yes. Uh, my, my mom said, um, I'm sorry, honey, you know, with your, since you wear glasses, and this was before all the surgeries that can correct this kind of stuff, she said, you, you can't be a fighter pilot. You can fly a regular plane, but you can't be a fighter pilot. And then I want to be an astronaut. Um, that's a tough job to get. Um, when, when NASA called me to come give a speech there, I, my first line was, oh, this is a call I've always wanted. You need an astronaut, right? And I said, no, we need a speaker. Um, for a while, I wanted to be a doctor. Then I wanted to be a newspaper publisher. And then I wanted to be an author. So at least the last one worked out. Right. Awesome. Uh, if you were to invite a historical figure to dinner, who would you choose and why? I would love to have dinner with Abraham Lincoln. He had such an incredible challenge to try to keep the nation together and wage war with all the – and a terribly – you know, when you study what happened in the Civil War, just how many people were maimed and how grisly that was, the, the burden on him. You can see it in the photos of him, uh, that how quickly he aged in office. I, a few people have had such a burden on them to be a powerful leader and have discharged it as well as he did. And I would just be, um, I I, I would just be dumbfounded to, to spend a couple hours with him. So I know that you, you are quite a a traveler. Uh, What, what is your favorite city, whether in the U S or abroad that you've been to? My favorite city. Uh, I have a weakness for Vancouver, British Columbia. It's the it's like taking the American Rocky Mountains and shoving them right up next to the coast in Maine. Two places I also like. That one seemed to be an interesting uh, amalgam of the two. It's just every time you turn around, it's 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 just breathtaking. So I know that you do like lobster. What is your favorite food? Uh, it's lobster, both because I, I just like the taste of it. And actually, I had a fantastic experience when I was in Maine. My manager who hired me and I moved my family across the country to to Maine on my one-year anniversary, he said, thank you for moving here. I know you moved your whole family here to help us out in the, in the business. Um, I don't know if you realize you've been here a year. Uh, you're doing a fantastic job. And he said, I want you go, to go down to the Harbor Market. It's all taken care of, paid for, everything. You just have to go them and t- go down and give your name. And they're going to take great care of you. And they're going to have four lobsters, live lobsters, with everything all packed up, ready for you to go. I brought those lobsters home. The kids and I played with them on the floor before we boiled them and ate them. So lobster... Uh, not only is do, do I love the taste of it, it also has a connection to an incredible recognition experience that I had when I was working in Maine. That's all about the experience, isn't it? Yeah, it has, it has great memories for all kinds of reasons. It's becoming very much a, an emotional food for me. All right, now, la- last question. Where can we find your book and how can our listeners follow you and BI Worldwide on social media? Uh, widgets is available most easily uh, on Amazon in small quantities. If you need um, a couple dozen for a, for a meeting, CEO Read is a great resource to get uh, a number of business books for a, for a meeting, and they, they ship directly from McGraw-Hill, uh, my publisher's um, warehouse, and they get pretty good prices on that. Uh, the best website for people to go to is workhappier.com. There is, as I mentioned earlier, there's a version of the job assessment that it takes about five minutes, 
and people get an instant reading on their job. They get a work happier number that, it, let's say it's 77. That means that on that day, they are happier than 77% of people in the United States, and they are less happy than the 23% above them, and then tells them where they are on each of the 12 uh, new rules that we talked about uh, earlier in our discussion. That also links to my social media, um, Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is um, R O. There's two D's in Rod. R O D D underscore W A G N E R. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. If you're on that website, I'm pretty easy to find. Email um, or get to any of the things that I that I write or or um, uh, podcasts and things. So I will link to this podcast uh, immediately after it's published. Well, and I will add all this information to the notes in the episode section as well. So again, the, just to remind everybody, the book is Widgets, the 12 new rules for managing your employees as if they were real people. So thanks, Rod, for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Stefan. It was fantastic. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.